Well, hello, everybody. We're back. We're back. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless our time together and bring in those who would come to the study today and open our hearts up so that we would learn the things you want us to know and so that we would know more about you and about who you are and who we are in you. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. Please uh, let me know when you come in. Uh, if you would, I would appreciate that. Uh, let's see, we are in Romans. Let me quote this. We're in Romans chapter 1. In verse 4. So I'm going to read the first three verses just to catch us up. And then we'll start from there. Romans 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. We looked at that last time that in both his lineages, Jesus' lineages through his mother and through his stepfather, uh, Joseph, both of them go back to David. And so we saw that, hey, Jennifer, I hope you're feeling well. Um, and then in verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Hey, Joe. Good to see you, Joe Yobro. Um, Here we see that in the first four verses of this letter, the entire Godhead is mentioned. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and Holy Spirit. Paul writes that Jesus was declared. This means appointed or decreed to be the primary Son of God by being resurrected from the dead. And this happened according to or through the power of the Holy, the Spirit of Holiness, one of the Holy Spirit's many names. Whenever Jesus raised anyone from the dead, it was the Holy Spirit working through his physical body who did this. Jesus would do his part in obedience to the Father and laying on hands or speaking to the deceased or whatever it is the Lord told him to do. And the Spirit would bring life back to that body. And this is important to us. Because in Romans 6.6, 6, Paul will tell us that every Christian spiritually experienced death, burial, and resurrection. With Jesus. So in a real sense, we've experienced the Holy Spirit's resurrection. And he speaks of this also in Romans chapter 8. Let me see, where am I? I'm looking for my, yeah, my references. Here you go. And when we read this, remember that if and since are real close in the Greek. Hey, Barabi. I think that's how you say your name. Romans eight eleven, But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. I wonder what would happen if more of us would, would receive this, if we grasped this idea and applied it to ourselves. Think about it. We have been spiritually raised from the dead. Isn't that amazing? Do you ever think about that? That we've been raised from the dead? Isn't that amazing that the Holy Spirit has done that for us? We no longer are who we were prior to being saved. Prior to being saved. We were spiritually dead. In Romans 6, Verses 3 to 4, he says this. 
We're going to go more into depth on any of these verses out of Romans when we get to them. But I just wanted to, to point these things out. And Paul says, do you not know? And, and the reason that he says that is that most of us do not know. Um, he said, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we would also walk in the newness of life. Another way, in other words, we no longer need to automatically sin. Again in Romans 1, 4, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power. According to the Spirit of Holiness. Now the word here is power. In the, in the Greek, it comes from the Greek word dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S. And that has to do with ability force. The fact is, only the Holy Spirit of God has the power to resurrect people. Humans don't. Here we see that by resurrecting Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit made a declaration about who Jesus was and is. The son, of, the son of God. Hey, Lynn, hope you're feeling well. And he said, and he declared him uh, to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness through the resurrection or by the resurrection from the dead. Throughout the scriptures, the Holy, the Holy Spirit has given various names. Each of these names emphasizes one aspect of who he is and what he does in the lives of people. The term spirit of holiness refers to the Holy Spirit's role in making the unholy, taking the unholy, which we were, and transforming it into something holy. That he holifies us, if you will. I made a word up, holifies. I mean, check, check out Romans chapter 9. Later on, Paul's going to quote, he's going to write this in, in what we know as Romans 9, 21 through 24. You know, I can always tell when I'm excited about teaching because I talk too fast and I'm trying to make myself slow down a little bit. Paul says in Romans 9, starting in verse 21, he says, Does not the power, does not the potter have power? Over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another one for dis another for dishonor. What if God? So he's given a hypothetical which he has actually done. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, what if God, wanting to do that, endured with much suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he called, not of Jews only, but also the Gentiles. Um, time out while I answer Joe's question. Laurie's doing great. She's recovered from COVID. She's doing well. Um, um, she doesn't have any lingering symptoms at all. Occasional cough. So the Holy Spirit is the active one, the Holy Spirit of, of holiness, is the active one affecting how we think whenever we yield ourselves to God and to the Holy Spirit. Later in Romans chapter 12, he's going to, to write this. Yeah, Joe, it's pretty amazing. She had hardly any any um, long-lasting symptoms. It was a real easy bout of COVID as COVID goes. She had mostly like what, a, what would look like a sinus infection. Um, hey, Donna, it's good to see you. So in Romans 12, Paul's going to write, Do not be conformed to this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Why? So that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. We're going to investigate all these verses out of Romans as we get to them as we go through the study. But it's just suffice it to say, hey, David Geiger, it's good to see you. It's suffice it to say that God accomplishes a lot through the Holy Spirit which uh, we quoted here in Romans 1, 4, that the Holy Spirit declared that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So he raised Jesus from the dead. Here in verse 5, we hear about what Jesus did concerning apostles and as concerning everybody getting grace. He says, through him, through this Jesus who was established and declared to be the Son of God, we have received grace. And in talking about himself and the other apostles, apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Jesus accomplishes a lot in our lives. And I, I believe that if we would spend time meditating on what he has accomplished so far, it would help us see more of what he's done. I think we give him short shrift on this. We talk about we're going to go to heaven when we die, and that's great. And, and you know, I say this a lot. If that was all I would get out of this, that's enough for me. But he gives us gifts and he restores us and he, he makes us holy and he makes us pure and he cleans us up and he washes away our sin on an ongoing basis. It's pretty amazing. The more we think about what he does in our lives, the more we'll appreciate it. Every Christian will have different gifts and different specific callings. Grace will be supplied to each one of these. And for each one of these, a divinely supplied equipping to accomplish that calling. When, when we hear about grace in the church, often somebody will say it's um, amazing. Or somebody will say that grace is um, unmerited favor. And those are two definitions of grace, but I think it goes deeper than that. I believe that God supplies grace, and I can prove it through the scriptures, supplies grace for specifics in the scriptures. In other words, if you're going to be a parent, you get parental grace. If you're going to be a dad or a mom, you're going to be, you get mother or father grace. And not just specific grace to be the mother and father of just to be a mom or, or a dad, but he gives a specific grace for the specific children that we get. So some of us have difficult kids. Some of us were difficult kids. I know I was. Um, but some of us um, get difficult kids and they feel like they don't have what it takes. But God gave them that child. And I believe God supplies grace for that child. I had a really good friend who... Um, I'm not going to name, but he was really harsh with his children, and that was his parenting style. And I had one of my boys was giving us a lot of trouble, and, and my friend took it upon himself to tell me that I wasn't being a good father to my kid. I had a problem with that idea. And I, and I looked at him, and I said, do you know why that boy's not your son? And he said, why? And I said, because you don't have what it takes to raise him. And my friend got real angry because he figured if you just got tough with them, they would all roll over. But not all the kids respond to that. And I said, God gave me this child. God picked me to be this child's father. God is supplying me grace for that child. And I'm doing my best to harvest that grace and I'm going to do it the way the Lord tells me to do it, not the way the Lord tells you to raise your children. 
Every Christian is going to have different gifts, and each one is going to get a divine supply of grace for that gift. So if you're a pastor, then you get pastoral grace. If you're a mom, if you if you open your home to people, you're going to have the gift of uh, hospitality, but you're also going to have grace for that. You're going to have grace to be a servant if you serve. You're going to have to be grace giving grace to give if you're a giver. It's just the way God works it. He supplies the ability power to do what he calls us to do. So our job basically is to discern what it is he wants for us to do and then to do it. To just go ahead and do it. So and then to harvest that grace. But and some of these things, these callings, seem a bit daunting. You know, they just feel like they're too much for us. But I don't think God would give it to us if we didn't, if we didn't have from him what it takes to do it. I don't think we have it in our flesh to do it. It's a God thing. So we must draw on his spiritual supply. In Paul's case, and this is true of all the other apostles as well, former apostles in the first century and any that would be walking the earth today, he had grace for apostleship, which he first mentioned in the first line of this letter when he mentioned that he was an apostle. And this means that we're given the privilege of functioning in some capacity in God's kingdom on the earth and we're given the authority any ability to do so. And we can see this is true as people respond to that grace in us and that grace through us. And if we watch for it, we'll see that grace at work in other people. Have you ever had one of those situations where you saw somebody doing something uh, for the Lord and you go, I, don't, I can't do that. I couldn't do that. I was a hospice chaplain for a while, and I loved it. It was one of the favorite things I've ever done. I hated that people needed hospice, but I was really excited and happy that people had hospice, and I was, I was a chaplain for hospice. And I've had people tell me, oh, I don't think I could do that. And my answer is always to say, if you're called to it, you can do it. Because God is going to release grace for that. Paul was, be, was given grace. He was given grace to go forth, which is what apostles do, and introduce the concept of, he says, I was, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations of the earth in, in his name, for his name. So Paul was given grace to go forth and introduce and administrate the concept of obedience to the faith to all the nations that God would have him go to. Not all nations, but all the nations God would lead him to. This has to do with him being able to pay attention to the Lord so that we can, so he could accomplish what God has in mind for him. And that means that we need to pay attention to the Lord so we may accomplish whatever he has in mind for us. In the body of Christ right now, there's a lot of cookie cutter ordination going on where somebody sees that somebody's doing something and they think, oh, I'd like to do that. And then they kind of like become an evangelist. So they become a, a, an um uh, what do they call those guys, missionary, or they become something, and they just decide they want to do it, and maybe God never even told them to do it. Well, you can't listen to them. If I go to the mission field, let's say, let's say to Africa or Thailand or inner city, Detroit, or wherever the mission field is, and I just go there on my own, God never sent me there in the first place. So there's nothing to listen for from him. Quick example. I did prison ministry for a bunch of years. And then one day the Lord said, this season is coming to a close. And it was time for me to stop doing prison ministry. So I went again. And oh, it was miserable. 
I had no grace for that trip. I was talking to my friend Ray Ward about it recently, and and uh, I had I had no grace to be there. I was I was just empty, and and it was it was bad, and it was just I was I was out of sorts. It didn't it didn't feel right. It wasn't me. I had nothing to give to anybody. But I committed to the weekend, so I did it. So years later, so I quit doing prison ministry with Bill Glass Ministries. And year, years later, I was involved with the church congregation in this town. And they had, um, once a month, they would go to a prison and um, minister there. And I was preaching, and well, I was speaking from the pulpit anyway, teaching from the pulpit in that building when they were gone. And I wanted to be able to tell people I knew what it was like so I could decide whether I would, you know, refer people to be a part of what they were doing. So I went. And it was a bad idea because the Lord never told me to go. I had it. Mike had a great idea. It was not. It was a bad idea. And it was to go on this prison ministry trip. And the way it worked in this place was they got a list of names they committed to go. And it had to be an even number of people. And if I had decided to back out, someone else wouldn't have been able to go in. So I went in on Saturday and Sunday. And I remember walking in after being shook down and searched and all that. And I was the last one walking down the hallway to where we were going to meet with the prisoners. And I was talking to the Lord. And I said, Lord, I feel like I am so dry that if I cough, dust will come out. I just don't have anything. And I walked a few more steps, and I heard in my spirit the Lord say, well, I thought we agreed not to do this anymore. <laughs> we did. I just reneged on my agreement. I went in. So it's important, that's my point, that we pay attention to the Lord so we would accomplish whatever he has in mind for us. And so that we don't waste our time and waste other people's time doing stuff that God would never have us do. So in Romans 1 5, and I'll quote that again. We've studied through that. We're going to look at the last three words now. Peace. Through him, through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. The last three words of this sentence are important, especially for those, this is important, especially for those who seem to see ministry as a way to advance their own names, to advance themselves, or to advance their own agendas. This is not about what we want. This is not about advancing us. This is all to happen in Jesus' name, which means for his authority. It's not for our own name. It's not for our organization's name. It's not for our personal glory. It's always about Jesus. And it's never, ever about us. I see a whole lot of glorification of organizations on Facebook where people use salvations and use people being baptized and use people being baptized in the Spirit and use crowds to, to justify what they're doing and to somehow make it about themselves. It's not. And you don't have to make it about yourselves for God to support your ministry. If the Lord said to do it, do it. Don't worry about the funding. Don't worry about the rest of that. You just do it. If you need to work a regular job, you work a regular job, but you do what God said to do. Let him provide the opportunities. Let him provide 
the income. Let him provide whatever glory you get. You know, I don't I don't see it that way at all. But but uh, let's let's remember this is for what did it say? For his name. For his name. Whenever I send out a thank you note for anything that anybody's donated to our work, I always write in his service and I sign my name because that's how I see it. I serve people to some degree, but really I'm serving the Lord and people is what matters to him. Then, when Paul says that, then to make sure they knew, Paul made sure to inform them that this is not just for those who happen to have the, the, the title or the role of apostle. He says, he includes everybody. He says, among whom you are also the called of Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, despite the fact that man-made religion has added a pyramid-style business-like um, structure where there are some people elevated over other people in the organization, there are no levels of Christianity when it comes to value. It's very important that we always remember everybody who's born again Jesus paid the same price for each one of them. So everybody has equal value. Someone who dresses better, who has more money, who stands higher than us. When we're sitting in the audience and they're up on the stage, um, they're not more elevated in God's eyes. They're just standing up on a stage, right? And they have a role, and if they're, they're performing the role that God called them for, well, good for them. And it's going to yield good things. And if God speaks through them and teaches through them, then we're going to see some good fruit. But they're not more elevated, and they're certainly not more valuable. We progress, each one of us as Christians, from infancy to adulthood. Theoretically. Now, I think that there's plenty of us that have stunted growth. There's lots of retarded growth in the body of Christ. In fact, in some places, I think the structure actually um, encourages uh, spiritual retardation as we as we become dependent upon the heavy hitters and the important people, while the rest of us just pay for them to be important and do their thing. I, I don't think that's God's design. I don't think it's a, our design for us all to stay babies. We progress from infancy, ideally, to adulthood as Christians, but we all share the very same value, no matter where we are in our, in our level of maturation. The value is the purchase price that Jesus paid for us. And if you study with me, you'll see that I, I, there's some verses that I quote every single time. And I think it's because they're not well known enough. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, Paul's going to write to the believers in Corinth and he's going to say, you were bought at a price. He could say that about every single one of us. We were all bought at a price. And then he says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, apostrophe S, which belongs to God. Our body and our spirit does not belong to us. But he set a price, he set a value by spending the best thing ever, Jesus' life and blood, for us. So we're valuable. Every believer, Paul says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Every believer was called to obedience to Christ the same way. How did that happen? Well, in John 6, verse 44, we see this. He called us. 
No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise them up on the last day. And also this verse out of John 10, 27. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Paul was aware that most of us recipients of this letter were Gentiles, but some were Jews. And some of those had been at Pentecost in Jerusalem. And some of those were Gentile converts to Judaism. And we see this in Acts 2, 10 to 11. <coughs> Excuse me. It was important that the Gentile Christians, especially here, that they were also the called of Jesus Christ. Since Gentile converts to the Jewish faith were always considered to the Jews to be inferior to people who were born Jewish. It was important for them to hear that they were the called of Christ. In Christ, every one of us is equally cherished. In Romans uh, 1 7, Paul writes this. In verse 1 7, he says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's writing to Rome originally. Here we are, wherever you are, wherever I am, Decatur, Texas. Um, and we're seeing this letter that was written, and it, it applies to us too. But who, to all who are in Rome, listen to what he says, Beloved of God. Here in verse 7, we see Paul greeting those to whom he hopes will receive this letter. Because those letters weren't guaranteed. They were traveling by hand. All the believers in Rome. That's who he hoped would read it. See how he addresses them first of all. Beloved of God. That word beloved is the Greek word agapetas. A-G-A. -A, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just copy it out. It's, it's this Greek word. I'm just going to quote this. Ver While I'm at it, I'll quote what what um, the Complete Word Study Dictionary, one of my favorite resources, has to say about it. Can y'all hear me okay? Because I'm not getting any feedback, so I don't know if I can hear if y'all can hear me. I think it's going pretty good. Can you hear me? That word beloved is the Greek word agapetos. According to the complete word dictionary, it means beloved, dear, but only spoken of Christians as united with God or with one another in the bonds of holy love. So when he says beloved of God, he's talking about a group of people that's born again. And it's only spoken about us, about born again people. So do you ever sit around thinking about that? Do you ever sit around pondering that you be loved by God? You, that's what beloved means. You be loved. That he, he considers you to be his dear one. You know, it's not a week that goes by when either online or in a text or in a room someplace, somebody tells me that they don't think God cares about them. And they're born again. And it's just a lie from the devil. He, we are beloved of God. And next he tells the Roman believers that they're called to be something. Called to be what? Called to be saints. Now this is the third time in seven verses, but really it's just two sentences. Third time in two sentences that he mentions being called. This cannot be happenstance. The word called means invited, 
and or welcomed. And it seems to emphasize the incredible privilege we have to be born again and mem members of the family of God. Remember when we saw saints earlier in the beginning, in Romans 1, 1 I think it is, or 2. Um, let me look so I could be right. I don't think we've seen this yet. Here we see it. Saints. Remember, a saint um, just simply is another word. It's a synonym to being born again. There are, there are religious groups out there who've overcomplicated Christianity and added stuff and taken stuff from the Word of God um, that have committees when someone has performed really well and then they decide whether his performance is good enough or her performance is good enough and then if they do then they pronounce him to become to be saints like uh, Mother Teresa is a saint you know and I went when I was a kid I was a member of one of these or I was made to go to church at one of these and we went to St. Cecilia Church and, and um, who is Cecilia? I don't even know but was was somehow considered to be a super Christian because of works and because of behavior. Meanwhile, all that time for two thousand years, the word saints, which I think is a Greek word, I can look it up, because um, I have it on my Bible program here. Called to be Hagios, H A G I O S. All it really means Let me look at the dictionary. It means to be set apart, to be holy, to be consecrated. It it, it just basically talks about us being born again. All those things happen to us. We don't need a committee meeting. We don't need anybody voting in some kind of closed meeting to decide if we're good enough to be called the saint. Did you receive Jesus as your Lord? Are you born again? If the answer is yes, you're a saint. Saint Lynn, Saint Joe, Saint Jennifer, Saint Mike. Who else do we have in? Saint Donna, Saint Barabi, Gary. St. Gary, we're all saints in Christ. We're born again. So it means to be invited. We were invited to become holy. It seems to emphasize the privilege we had to be born again and members of the family of God. And then at the end of that, the second half, he says, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, and then he pronounces something over them. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the greetings, the first few sentences of this letter. To all who are in Rome. As Paul closes his greetings, he pronounces a blessing over them. You know, we say stuff like this, God bless you. And, and it's like to say, well, goodbye. And like we say goodbye and God bless you instead. But I'm actually, I'm actually asking the Lord to do something, to bless somebody. Here, the, the blessing is grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. The word grace is the Greek word charis. It's, it's uh, spelled like this. Charis. It's where we get the word charismatic because the spiritual graces were visible. The basic definition of grace has to do <clears throat> with it being a free gift from God which, is, which accomplishes something in people and results in rejoicing. A Bible study of this topic has led me to understand that God supplies grace to people that accomplish 
like I was saying earlier, the things he would have us to do. The primary verse that I turn to for that is this one out of um, out of 1 Corinthians 3.10. Paul says this. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another laid builds on it but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Whenever Paul speaks grace to someone he is sure God will give that grace. <clears throat> when I read this it reminds me to look for that grace. Look for evidences of the grace that God has given us to do it. So some of you guys in here are mommies. Uh, <clears throat> some of you might be dads. Some of you are single folks that do other things, that have other things, that have businesses, that have jobs. Whatever it is, we're called and we have grace to be that. God chose you to be what you are. And this is especially true for those times in which we feel inadequate for the task before us. We need to remember that God always supplies for our needs. And Paul wrote that to the Philippian believers. And he said this pretty plain, uh, how all-encompassing it is. God shall supply some of your need, one of your needs. No, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So in accordance to his riches and glory. How filthy rich is the Lord? He can supply whatever it is we need. Now the word peace, he says God also speaks peace to him. We're going to get into this when we start up again next time. Because we're going to go... Oh heck, I'll do it right now. Um, <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You might go a couple minutes over. This word is widely misunderstood in the church and in the world. And actually the, the world has polluted the church. And that's why the church doesn't understand it. To us, peace seems to me the absence of conflict and to be sure that would be a good thing to experience in the church which is much contention and strife there is in a typical church board meeting for instance this word is sometimes used to describe the cessation of war but that is not what this means in the bible when it's referring to people and people groups in the church the word peace is a translation of a Greek word. And I'm gonna I'm gonna just take this paragraph and and paste it in a room so that it'll be part of the permanent record. This will be on your permanent record. Um, peace is a translation of the Greek word irene. When it refers to people groups, it has to do with the reestablishment of a unity which once existed but has been destroyed. At one point, we were one in the garden, and then we were divided. Sin has divided all of humanity into different groups. People identify with their nation of origin, with their race, with their gender, all sorts of things. Sometimes they try to change some of those. However, in Christ, the scripture clearly teaches that we're supposed to be one. In fact, in reality, we are one in Christ, which was the desire of the Lord. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paste some scriptures that say that. And I do this often because the church doesn't function the way Jesus wants us to. So I'm going to paste all three of these. Now I am no longer in the world, Jesus speaking, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name 
those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. John 17, 11. In John 17, 21, he says that may, they, may all, they all may be one, that we would function as in peace. We would function as a unit, that we may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And one of the reasons I'm convinced that some people don't believe Jesus was sent by the Father is because the church functions as if it's schizophrenic, as if there's there's a million parts to it, and it's not. There's one body of Christ, but we don't act that way, so we don't look like it. And I think people have gone to, to hell because of it. And in John 17:22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them. Why? Jesus supplied us with glory. Why? So that we may be one, just as Jesus and the Father is one. Sadly, the devil has so infiltrated the point to the church to the point that in any given geographical area, the church does not function at all as one because it sees itself affiliated with denominations and congregations and buildings and subsets and most of them are in competition. It's like businesses all trying to same, sell the same hamburger, but I want you to come to my restaurant. It does, the church does not see itself in most geographical areas as one with other Christians. Instead, they're in competition with one another. We used to have, um, and I still think they do this somewhere in the county, but they had these unity services once a month. And there was like, uh, I think at the time, 110 congregations in our county. And uh, seven or eight of them, maybe 10 of them, uh, practiced this. So they weren't even, it was like 1% 1 1 of the whole church, right? Well, 10% of the whole church in Wise County that was attending buildings um, would go to this thing. And they'd all sit in this building. And they were like, yay, we're having a unity service. We're at peace. And the very first thing they would do, <coughs> every single time, who's here with Bob's Church of Rama? Who's here with this first something fill in the blank? Who's here with this? And the people would separate. They would stop being one in the first five minutes of the meeting to be affiliated with the people they went to the building with on a regular basis. In Matthew 12, Verse 25, Jesus said something I thought applied here. This is why the state, the body of Christ is in the state it's in. Jesus knew their thoughts and he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to destruction and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. As a result, despite the Lord's hope that the world would believe the Father sent him, the world largely does not. And one of the biggest impediments to the salvation of the lost is our current church system, which goes completely against God's will. What exists in the current church system is by definition the spirit of division, the opposite of peace. When Paul wrote to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When he wrote that to the church, which was in Rome, he was well aware of all the potential divisions which could exist there. There were Jews and Gentiles. And then there were all the various other people groups represented in, in, in Rome among those two groups. His blessing of peace was to inspire the believers in Rome to see themselves as being one with all the other believers in their in their area in Rome instead of seeing themselves as Jewish believers or Gentile believers or Scythian believers and so on and despite the damage done to the modern church by 1700 years 
of institutionalism, we can st still, if we choose to, see ourselves as one with all the other Christians in our area if we choose to do so. Now most won't agree with us because most of them love their church family more than they love the whole body of Christ. And most people won't agree with us, but so what? This recognition of priest of a peace is really between each one of us and our Savior. And we get to practice that if we choose to. So I hope I hope you'll meditate on that. I hope anybody that sees that will meditate on that. I mean, I, I attend buildings sometimes that are meeting separate from the rest of the body of Christ because, frankly, nobody meets as the body of Christ as a group. You know, it just doesn't happen much. Although I have seen some... Um, some Christians turn out for um, praying at the flag and nobody cares what church you're with there. And, and um, people show up when there's a big function, um, you know, for, for, for things. And, and people support the works of various ministries in the county. And uh, it doesn't really matter what church you go to to them. They just want to take care of what God put in place. But each of us can do it. It just takes each of us deciding that being one with the body of Christ is more important than being a member of a subset. And you can do that and be a member of a subset if you want. Anyway, I'll get off that soapbox for now. We'll pick it up ne later next time. There's a couple of things I want to say before we pray uh, to keep an eye out for. Um, there's going to be something happening out of my back offices. We, we're converting one of the rooms into um into a radio station a studio and and there's several of us are going to have regular shows we don't know the times and we haven't set it up yet and we need to get some things in place but keep an eye out for it it's going to be called truth seekers radio i'm going to have a show on it uh charlie smithers is going to have a show um his his name is, um, of course, uh, the Traveling Salvation Show. Um, my name is going to be called Life Skills Discipleship. Uh, our show, my show, and we're going. We'll have we'll have guests and stuff. It's going to be good. And so keep an eye out for that. We're really excited about it. When we're ready to announce it, we're going to show you how you can uh, get an app that will guide you to that radio station. And uh, we just have to find somebody to write it. And we're putting everything together and soundproof in the room. And um, we have a couple other people that we're not ready to announce yet that are going to be uh, regular um, radio hosts. So um, that's something we're real excited about. I'm also looking at um, recording some audio podcasts and then um, putting them on a podcast platform, just trying to increase uh, the impact our ministry has uh, on behalf of Jesus Christ. Remember, like he says in Romans uh, 1, where was that? Um, five, we receive grace among all the nations for his name. And that's what this is really about. It's not to expand ours. We might show, we might need investments. We might need some advertisers. But right now we're looking for a guy who, or a woman who writes apps because uh, we need an app really bad. Um, so let's pray. Father, I thank you for this Bible study. I thank you for those who make it that and not just um, uh, me coming in and talking uh, or teaching. Um, it's not a lecture. It's interactive to the, uh, with the limitations of um, a Facebook uh, live Bible study. Uh, we thank you that people can comment. We thank you that people let us know we're here. they're here. We thank you that people spend time being a part of what we do. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you're still teaching us and guiding us, and we're still learning. I ask you to be with us, Father, as we go through our week. I ask you to, to set our plans in place. I ask you to administrate those plans. 
I ask you to guide us and I ask you to show us the grace that you have for us and for what you call us to do. Father, I ask you to reveal to each one of us, if we don't know it yet, what our calling, calling or callings are and show us the grace you gave so that we can be confident to move in those callings and accomplish your intentions for it. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our videos are located here if you need to find them. Um, and also, I always post this, that we have um, a bunch of articles on, the, on our ministry website. And um, remember, if you want to be on my, um, on the advanced team for giving, um, I guess it's subscribing to articles and stuff, People who uh, tell me they want that, give me their email address and a private message or email me and I, um, they get first crack at anything I write. They get to see it before I post it on Facebook or put it on my website. So anyway, I love you guys. God bless you. Thank you for taking the time to be here. And uh, I'll see you next time, Lord willing. Bye-bye.